Just in case you missed it, it's the top five sports talkers of the day. Now, it's time for Dan Barrero's Top 5 at 5. It is indeed that time, again, a very full final 90 minutes of this program that will include some history talk, will include some medical conversation, and uh, who knows what else. Where would you like to begin? With Gino Ariema talking about Danny Hurley on the Dan Patrick Show today, which you could have heard on KFAN+, Plus, which you'll hear a little bit later tonight right here on The Fan. Yesterday at this time, it was J.J. Redick on his way to work with our guy Mike Trudell on Lakers Television. Today, apparently it's Danny Hurley, the UConn coach who's coming off back-to-back national championships. Is being uh, the full court press is being put on him, according to Woj of ESPN, to become the next Lakers coach. So this morning, Gino was on Dan Patrick. Nice coincidence. And Dan asked him this. Here's a couple of minutes. So, what's your reaction to Danny Hurley? You know, this is really funny because uh, I happened to be with at a thing with him um, last night. And uh, I have no idea what's going on. You know, I have no idea where this, where this is going and what's happening. But I said, just leaned over and I said, uh, hey, I think you can win a lot of championships with the Lakers, uh, you know, more so than a guy who's never coached. And um, he just looked at me and, you know, nodded and we had a good laugh. And then this morning I wake up and voila. So I don't know what's going on. And it'd be a bad day for UConn for sure if this happens. And it would be a great, great day for Dan Hurley and a, I'm sure a bittersweet day for Dan Hurley. Okay. Now you're being serious that you did bring this up to him last night about the Lakers, John? Uh, out of out of nowhere, I just leaned over and I said, you know, I don't know why it came to me. I don't know why, but I said it, and and if you ask him, he'll tell you. And I had no idea. And I woke up this morning and somebody <laughs> sent it to me, and I went, "You got to be kidding me." I know that he's talked about not going to another college job. That if he does go down the road when he thinks he's mature enough to coach in the NBA, this happened a lot quicker. But I'm wondering the state of college basketball, certainly men's college basketball, Gino, does that um, make this decision a little bit more, I guess, palatable or easier when you think about him wanting to go to coach the NBA instead of trying to go for a three-peat? Um, all those are true. I think um, the state of college basketball is a mess. Uh, anyone who, if anybody could manage it, though, it would be Danny because... He coaches this program like it's a high school program, like he coached the St. Benedict's. Their player development program is second to none. Um, But I do think that being at UConn and given the state of college basketball and the amount of money now that it's going to take to be able to put together a national championship team every single year, I think, uh, and without knowing where it's going, it's a charade. It's this idea of student athlete, student athlete welfare. Every single thing that comes out of the NCAA's mouth about student athlete welfare, mental, it's bullshit. That, that, that has no factor ever anymore. And I never want to hear anybody utter those words associated with college basketball. They are, they are professional athletes, just not called that. So you might as well go coach professional athletes where it's real. Now, if Danny were to leave and somebody said to me, you know, he just took this nba job i won't name any particular city i would say you know you're set up for failure but it's the lakers and if i don't know the details of it but if you're saying hey i want a 10-year deal i want the same deal brad stevens got at boston it might be more than that well dan you know what i hey andrea's wife might not like me but (laughs) it's crazy if he doesn't take it (laughs) but interesting do you think he's telling the truth do you think he I almost wonder if somehow some way there had been some sort of surreptitious conversation that Hurley was whispering something about hey, I've gotten some interesting phone calls the last it's just it's, it's too weird the night before it becomes a woge bomb the Lakers are after you I don't know it's pretty I'm not interesting sure. I think Because to me, he'd have to cover his base that way a little bit. Otherwise, he's admitting that already there was there was some discussion there. Um, He did, by the way, today tell his team, Danny Hurley, that he has been talking to the Lakers. Good for him. 
because they have practice. You know, the, all the right. teams now are back. You know, like the Gophers just got back on campus for summer workouts and stuff. And he said, for now, guys, it's business as usual. But I want to be honest with you. This is according to John Fanta, who covers college hoops. Um, I had, you know, the Lakers have contacted me and I'll keep you posted on everything. But for now, we've got practice. So get on the line, essentially. Well, you got at least, yeah, you, you, you sort of have to confront it. Um, I mean, he... I tended to believe him when he said, "What, what job? What name? What, what spe- there was speculation on some job, somebody college being interested in him." And didn't he like shoot it down like the next day? Was it Kentucky? Kentucky? It was a Kentucky yes. job. Yep. And I tended to believe that with him, that he's not going to leave for another college job, but they're probably going to make an offer too good to refuse. And and you brought it up earlier. Uh, you heard it from from uh, Gino there too. Part of what sometimes dictates uh, the transition being successful for a college coach trying to make the jump to pros is what's he walking into? How good is the team? Are they starting over? What's the infrastructure? Lakers are... It's tricky, though, with the Lakers, though, right? Because LeBron at most, what, one more year? I, I, I think. I, I don't know. I mean, they're, they're, they still strike me... They're not awful. You're not starting over with them, but I'm not convinced they are a team ready to make a run. So then are they the per- going to be eternally one of those stuck in the middle kinds of teams where you don't get anywhere? I I, I find it hard to believe that he and uh, D'Angelo Russell would coexist very Ooh, successfully. That would be tough. I think that might be a tough um, that would marriage. Be tough. But that, it, maybe that's one of the things they're talking about. It's an interesting story. There's no question about that. And as we talked about earlier, I'm always fascinated when a big time a college coach, and he's at the top of the profession right now, right on the basis of what he's done the last couple of years, uh, flirts with the idea of, even though he's identified as a college guy, going to the NBA. How about this for efficiency last night? Nafisa Collier, 25 points yeah, on 10 of 15 shooting, also collected nine rebounds, led four Lynx players in double figures as they go into, speaking of the Lakers, where the Lakers play. Uh, in Los Angeles and drill the Sparks 86 to 62. So the Lynx are now 7 and 2 on the season. They are 3 and 1 away from home and as I pull up the standings Dan in the WNBA, the Lynx are one game behind the New York Liberty for second place. They're third place in the WNBA standings at the moment, a couple of games ahead of the Las Vegas Aces and Cheryl Reeve moved to number 2 all time passing Bill Lambeer in WNBA victories, WNBA victories last night. Yeah, the quote from the other day when she tied him was something the effect of, I'm not going to be satisfied just, you know, until I'm past Bill Lambeer because she's had this sort of love, hate, and like to to talk about stuff as her old boss. Yep. Um, Lindsey Whalen and I, because we're both great basketball minds. See the game clearly. Came to the same conclusion about how you know that the head coach enjoys this team more than her last one, perhaps last two. There were times both of us are watching a game the other day and we can't find her standing on the sidelines. You know why? She was seated. She was just watching her team, which isn't to say she wasn't, I'm sure, still involved, but um, it's almost like with her, it's like, well, I, I don't have as much to complain about right now. Very different role, and they're good. There's no, and we probably should have her on again soon to celebrate the uh, the her, her latest milestone. And as you said, co- the, the, some of the numbers Collier is putting together mm-hmm. day after day, like all around numbers, as you said, um, she's on the fast track right now, man. There's no question about that. And I think it's safe to say that we're we're once again playing Lynx basketball. Definitely, yeah, for sure. Defensively, they're flying yeah. around. That's what they talked about. Uh, after the win last night. Uh, the Twins, not playing Lynx basketball. No. They uh, lost again last night to the Yankees. We don't need to spend a lot of time on that. They got down 8-0, lost 9-5. One more in the Bronx tonight. They scored last, though. They did score last. Did yeah, they? Are we I'm sure? Pretty sure they scored last, yeah. Pablo Lopez opposing Marcus Stroman tonight in the first pitch about 45 minutes from now. So we're 0-5 against the Yankees. I mentioned at the top of the show, the New York tabloids are back to mocking the Twins after having to sort of go easier on that last year when the Twins won the season series. We're, we're not only, I, I think the uh, the numbers I put together were 0-5, outscored 33-8. to We know it's not good baseball. No, and Rocco seems to be getting grumpier about it as well, and uh, again, it's it feels like every game against the Yankees, they've uh, other than one, they've scored first or they've piled on early, and the rest of the game has almost been guard. You know, someone's like, 
when garbage time starts in the fifth inning, you know you got a problem. It's a long night. And who's the big strapping slugger the Yankees have? Aaron Judge. Judge, I think he had a three-run triple right down the, the line last night. He drove in five runs. Uh, Yankees are toying with us again, and we're not doing much to to dissuade dis- them, discourage the notion that we're a cute little club with a decent record. But every time, generally, we play somebody really, really good, we're not competitive. Not only do we not beat them, we're not competitive. Here's the top five. Is that top five? All right. Uh, knocker bottom of the hour. In fact, when we come back, I mentioned uh, the date. Getting a lot of attention today for uh, absolutely appropriate reasons. And we'll give you a little bit of uh, history when we return here on the Bumper to Bumper program. It is believed that there's an excellent chance that this year, today, will be the last major D-Day anniversary with living veterans in Attendance. The reasons should be obvious. We're talking about an event that took place 80 years ago today, D-Day, June 6, 1944, ushering in the beginning of the Allied effort to liberate much, if not all, of Europe. Now, some of us are old enough to know the story pretty well, not because we were alive during World War II, but... It happened close enough. I was born in 1955 that lots of movies were made. There were lots of individuals around who either served or had some memory of exactly what took place in that regard. But there is something kind of sad about the fact that you can't keep having these events, not because it's a moment not worth remembering any longer, but because the people you most want to honor, the, the, the folks who survived it, um, there ain't many of them around anymore. So the word on the street is, in France, um, they've gone all out on this occasion, understanding that this might be their last best chance. There's dignitaries all over the place, but more importantly, there are survivors, there are veterans um, of the D-Day you know, invasion, which of course started in northern France. And... Operation Overlord was the name of the mass, you could say, um, development of something like, well, by the end of that first day on the beach, or on the beaches of Normandy, what's been written is that almost 160,000 Allied soldiers made it to the beach by the end of the day. But there was, of course, great cost 4,000 troops killed landing on the beaches. The British and Canadians found light opposition to capturing the beaches codenamed Gold, Juno, and Sword. Americans had similarly good success taking Utah Beach. These, of course, were all the code names, But Omaha Beach, a lot tougher. Over 2,000 American casualties. Somebody wrote with a, with, a, with a photo, 90% of the soldiers on the first boats didn't leave to see the end of the day. He wrote, look at those faces. Some of them never made it to 18. Some, are, some never fell in love or had the opportunity to have children. They never voted or owned a home. They never saw parents again. And... If you've ever ever seen the shots, because you can find them, the film of the boats, those first landing craft, the first soldiers from the U.S., from France, from Britain. And you can't, Garzi, even imagine what's going through their minds because they kind of know they're going to be sacrificed. Somebody's got to go first, right? And so the ones that go first, there's a really good chance as you're waiting for them to drop that the, the front of the boat down so then you can sort of start swimming or wading through the water to be a sitting duck on the beach, you know you're gonna there's a good chance you're gonna die. It's so unfathomable for those of us who have never been in had to face those kinds of prospects, those kinds of situations. It's just it's just it's just like a, a another world. And so 
I think all of the effort to try to remind even people who are way too young to remember any of this is noble. It is worthy. We believe in history on this show. No matter how many years go by, the event itself was that momentous because of what it ushered in. Which brings us to the boys of Point Duhok. 225 members of the Army Ranger outfit that fought on that occasion. The, the point was a cliff top located between the Utah and Omaha beaches, estimated to be up to about 100 feet in height, and the American boys' job was to scale it. Um, uh, uh, among those, I've even seen some stuff written about some of the individuals um, who 40 years ago were there, On the 40-year anniversary of D-Day, when President Reagan spoke, a guy named William Petty, who at that point was 63, he had suffered two broken legs in training before joining the Rangers. Took him three tries to get to the top before he was successful. Thought to have killed 30 German soldiers that day alone. A former railroad brakeman named Leonard Bud Lomel shot in the side, still made it up the cliff later, and eventually uh, was able to take out two big German guns with thermite grenades. He also won the Distinguished Service Cross. There was a Ranger medic who earned his pay that day, just helping those who were wounded along the way. Made it up the cliff. Ended up with two Purple Hearts, and a bronze star, a guy named Tom Ruggiero, a pro tap dancer, before he entered the fray in World War II, plunged into the water on one of those boats when a shell hit his landing craft on D-Day, who ultimately was able to get to the top of it. And in a magnificent speech crafted by Peggy Noonan, who, of course, is now an award-winning columnist for, among others, the Wall Street Journal. We quote her early and often. Noonan wrote the speech. We can't play all of it, but on this occasion, we do play the about a two-minute stretch of what President Reagan had to say on that occasion. I think it's one of the most magnificently written and delivered speeches in the history of American presidents, without any question. Let's listen to what he had to say on the 40-year anniversary, so 40 years ago. Here in Normandy, the rescue began. Here, the Allies stood and fought against tyranny in a giant undertaking unparalleled in human history. We stand on a lonely, windswept point on the northern shore of France. The air is soft, but 40 years ago at this moment, The air was dense with smoke and the cries of men, and the air was filled with the crack of rifle fire and the roar of cannon. At dawn on the morning of the 6th of June, 1944, 225 rangers jumped off the British landing craft and ran to the bottom of these cliffs. Their mission was one of the most difficult and daring of the invasion, to climb these sheer and desolate cliffs and take out the enemy guns. The Allies had been told that some of the mightiest of these guns were here, and they would be trained on the beaches to stop the Allied advance. The Rangers looked up and saw the enemy soldiers, the edge of the cliffs, shooting down at them with machine guns and throwing grenades, and the American Rangers began to climb. They shot rope ladders over the face of these cliffs and began to pull themselves up. When one Ranger fell, another would take his place. When one rope was cut, a ranger would grab another and begin his climb again. They climbed, shot back, and held their footing. Soon, one by one, the rangers pulled themselves over the top, and in seizing the firm land at the top of these cliffs, they began to seize back the continent of Europe. 225 came here. After two days of fighting, only 90 could still bear arms. Behind me is a memorial that symbolizes the ranger daggers that were thrust into the top of these cliffs. And before me are the men who put them there. These are the boys of Puente Ho. (laughs) 
These are the men who took the cliffs. These are the champions who helped free a continent. And these are the heroes who helped end a war. May we never forget those who served and those who lost their lives literally changing the world. June 6, 1944, 80 years ago today. You know, Garzi, every time I worry about just how incredibly crowded and busy the schedule of our next guest must be, I say to myself, well, how busy can he be really when he can find the time today to like 12 different times tweet out some sort of GIF or image preparing our audience for his return to the Bumper to Bumper program? Was it 12? I think it was double digits. Yeah, there was a Jack Nicholson one. Yep. There have been so many. So I'm how- worried about the meetings he was supposed to be in exactly. but canceled. It's unbelievable. Bill Maurice, Mayo Clinic, Big Knocker, back with us. Uh, do you worry about that, that your bosses are going to go, well, God, he's not that busy. All he's done all day is tweet out his appearances on some stupid radio show in Minneapolis-St. Paul. No, I, I think it shows that I'm good at setting priorities and multitasking. <laughs> okay. uh, so I'm actually, it's, I'm doing it just to basically, it's my way of flexing, Okay, you know, my right. proficiencies. Is it, that's how I see it, as, and I'm sure that's how everyone else will as well. Well, it's good to hear your voice. It's been, uh, we've talked off air a little bit, but not on air in a while. And I had said post the Timberwolves run, it's a chance to clean up in a lot of areas and get reacquainted with people and get into other subjects. So I told guards earlier this week that this might be the week to uh, to get you. So um, we'll start with the obvious question. Um, you're busy as ever, traveling as much as ever. How's everything going? Oh, things are going well. I, they're going really well. It's, it's uh, you know, and it's a weird thing. It's, it, I've been busy, but it seems like the world is just a really busy place yeah. um, these days. And, and, and a lot of it is, you know, and, and the job I'm doing now for Mayo Clinic, I have to be out there, you know, forming relationships and, and working on, on on building things with others, and there's so much more. There's a real appetite for in-person meetings, and so uh, so I think that's a lot of it. There's been a lot happening on the government side, specific to labs that I've been involved with mm. as well. Um, so, which is an interesting development, and uh, and so yeah, those are the things that keep me hopping. Um, as well as then I end up staying up late watching Timberwolves games, which is all good. Yeah, that's all good until it got bad, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I've got a lot of we got a lot of ground to cover. Um, so we'll start with a text that just came in. You don't have a lot of time, I think, at this point uh, to listen to our show. But uh, the last couple of days, I have been exploring my fascination with what I thought was a late night commercial development, but others have said it, it's ongoing throughout the day. Um, the effort to promote this, these, these. Um, um, how do I call them? These uh, odor full body deodorants. products that are for full body help. Like I think it's Mando on the men's side. I can't remember the name of it on the women's side. Lume, Lume. I believe, or Lumi, whatever it is. And it would seem to suggest that somewhere along the line, people have decided bathing, you know, showering, not enough. I got to have some stuff that will take away all body odor all over my body, including in private locations as well. Now, I don't think this is part of your specialty necessarily, but you're, you're kind of a jack of all trades, medically speaking, when it comes to this sort of thing. You can handle pretty much anything. So have you, are you aware of this process, this trend, and um, are you amused by it? Do you find it rather silly? Do you say, well, this stuff's really, I don't know why this stuff would really be necessary if you just... You know, you have some basic principles when it comes to uh, to hygiene. What do you think this is all about? Well, I, I am aware of it. I don't personally use any of those products. Um, I, I've never dug in deep to the to the science or or the premise of them. I can tell you that different. You know, your a person's body odor is determined by a lot of different things. But one of the one of the major contributors are, are the your your microbiome, meaning the, the microbacteria that are just normally living on your skin. And you don't, can get disrupted, and there are certain bacteria, like propionobacteria, I think, species that can be quite odor-producing. They, you know, they produce the product, the, the organic acids and things that can be stinky. So I think that's what those products are aimed at, is kind of restoring your, your natural oh. or more 
a better microbiome is my understanding. Okay. I'm still a little bit, a little bit old school. I, I'm pretty much more just a shower guy. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's me. I did I have a personal experience once. I was with my family in a large retail store at a time when I was riding my bike a lot to work, um, and I didn't get a chance to shower all the time. And there was a young, nice young woman working there, and I asked her, you know, so so what does what does a person buy if they, you know, are really sweaty and they can't take a shower and they don't want to smell bad? And she just looked at me with horror, and my family <laughs> ushered me away. So that's as close as I, maybe I needed that product at uh, the time, and it just was that was the I was the target market, and I didn't even know it. That's too good. It's absolutely too good. Um, all right, so let's get to some other stuff as well. Do we need? Um I thought I read a New York Times story. I'm not. You may have brought it to my attention via Twitter, or maybe I saw it someplace else. Uh, regarding this was one of the, this was I think either last Sunday or the Sunday before, and I believe it was a doctor. I don't remember who it was, but it was raising some concerns about the way we're going about dealing with whatever form of bird flu that is now gaining a little bit of uh, momentum. Maybe, and you can maybe tell us not that much momentum, but um, that the feeling was. We're, we're not tr- getting on top of this. It may not be anything, but the only way you find out is you get on top of it. We need more testing, blah, blah, blah. So what can you tell us about the bird flu thing? Is it something worth being concerned with? Is it a classic case of clickbait where we're going to scare people a little bit too much? Where are we regarding this latest form, uh, allegedly, of bird flu? Well, I, the, the, I think the bottom line is, we we need to pay attention to it. I don't know. Be concerned. Any amount of attention we pay depends on what your role is. Right. So uh, so here's the background. I mean, this is an avian influenza, meaning it's an influenza virus that's been predominantly in birds. Uh, that just like other species, there are you know waves of infections, and so this particular avian flu outbreak has been quite lethal to bird populations, and so there's, it has impacted bird populations across the globe. Um, the concern is that knocker, knocker, knocker. He's not supposed to talk. Sounds like we lost him, man. You think? You think? Do you think the big brother stepped in? That he was about to say something that he wasn't supposed to say? Very, very suspicious. Interesting. Who's to say? Um, all right, well, I'm sure we'll get him back here in a minute, I hope. Was he local? Was he Rochester today? Do we even know where he, where the knocker was? Uh, if you have questions for him, we always take questions for the knocker. Bradshaw and Brian Cafe and text line is 64686. 64686. Some are already coming in, and uh, hopefully we'll get him back here in a minute. I think Garzi's checking to be sure that the line is um, is workable. And um, so far, it looks like they're having some difficulty. Um, also, while we're waiting, oh, we got him? We think we got him back? All right. What I, happened? I, I, I guess I'm out of practice. I mean, was that like, were you about to say something that was going to get you in trouble with the government? Is that what happened there? That's right. That's the new mayor. That's the new sensor phone they have me <laughs> on. So, Yes. No, I'm up in northern Minnesota, so I'm dealing with the, with the, with the, uh, with the variability in phone signal. But oh, okay. uh, no, I think, but the concern, I don't know where I got dropped, but the concern is that this flu has now crossed into cows and infected a few people. So it bears watching, um, but there's been no human to human spread. I don't think that that's imminent. Um, there, you'll read some things about how someone has passed away in Mexico with this virus now, and that in the past, this has been happening for a while, that it can be quite lethal. But that's not really known, and even the person that was, you know, reportedly died had a lot of other medical problems. So it's 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 worthwhile. We should be we should take solace in the fact that our health, you know, our health professionals are watching this to make sure that it's not something that becomes bigger. If it is that we know about it, but does the common everyday person need to be worrying about it? I don't think so. A tweet by you four hours ago, lead I should say lead in Beethoven's hair offers new clues to mystery of his deafness. New York Times uh, story, turns out you can learn a lot from testing hair. Proud, you write, that Mayo Clinic Labs was able to play a key role. What's this all about? Well, that's a, it's a super cool story. So I, since I knew I was coming on, I wanted to make sure I shared it. Yep. Um, so it turns out, of course, Beethoven was, was a star in his time, 
right? No and doubt. Kind of a he was a he was you know an, an, a, a quite the quite the figure. And so as he was getting ill, uh, and, and and people knew that he was getting ill, uh, they were getting lockets of his hair, and, and particularly after he passed away, because of course you know he became deaf. He died at a relatively early age. He had a lot of other problems with with uh, with his bowel. No one could figure out what was going on with him. Um, and then he died young. And so, but people had lockets of his hair, and there were a few of, of, of collectors would would buy them. And there, I think, were three hair samples that collectors owned that they were able to genetically confirm because you can actually do genetic testing on hair that it was from Beethoven. And so the question was then, could Beethoven's hair hold clues as to why, what was wrong with him? And so some of that hair was actually sent to my colleague, Dr. Paul Gennetto, here at Mayo Clinic Labs, Mayo Clinic, and who's a world expert in toxicology testing. And they tested the hair and found that it had extraordinarily high levels of lead, and, as well as some other metal toxins. I think like mercury was another one. Why is that so interesting? Well, it's interesting because, number one, lead poisoning could account for all the symptoms that were described. Mm. Number two, it also was quite common in wine uh, during Beethoven's, uh, when Beethoven lived, particularly in cheaper wines. They would use lead to, to line the bottles. They would actually use lead to um, sweeten the wine. And ironically, people were giving him more wine, and he was drinking more wine as he got sicker because he was depressed, number one, about I think. And number two, because they thought it would have medicinal purposes. So he probably poisoned himself uh, through the consumption wow. of wine, and we can learn that through his hair. Uh, how, where do you guys come in? We, we did the testing. So it was my colleague here at Mayo mm -hmm. that actually tested the hair. So we test, even though the hair is, you know, a couple hundred years old, um, it's still, you, hair actually Remarkable. contains a lot of what you eat. It gets in your hair permanently, and so until it's, of course, it's shattered, you cut it. So that's why we can do drug testing on hair as well. So, yeah, it was a, we usually use it for drug testing here, but we actually did test it in our laboratory for, for toxins, and we, that's what we found. You've had a lot of, and, and by the way, if, if, if people aren't following you, they should, because then you have a link to the story, the New York Times story, that will give, obviously, even more detail than you gave today. you got a lot of good, juicy, interesting tweets lately. Uh, let, me, let me toss up another one and get your uh, feeling on it, or maybe an opportunity to... Um, to, to flesh out this particular story, you write, dementia caused by a number of diseases like Alzheimer's is a looming health crisis. While not entirely preventable, it's important to know the risks and to get tested for a diagnosis as some forms are treatable if caught early. So remind people, you know, what dementia is and why you, can't, you, you characterize it as a looming health care crisis. Well, it's, so dementia is it really is a symptom, right? And it's what we think of as when, when people, um, you know, when they lose the ability to think, they lose cognitive memory loss. Um, you know, we there's a lot of names that we call it. Alzheimer's disease is one type of dementia. It's particularly common. Um, it's caused by there's different causes for the different types. Um, as you know, my my mother-in-law actually passed away from a different type of de dementia called Lewy body dementia. Um, so they all have their different pathophysiologies, if you will. Uh, Alzheimer's dementia is characterized by abnormal proteins that cause uh, plaques and tangles in your brain. Um, and so that was when I trained, the only way to diagnose Alzheimer's disease definitively was actually in a postmortem examination of the brain. Um, during my, my time, they developed really a kind of expensive radiology tests to look for, for Alzheimer's disease specific signals. But what's been really uh, quite uh, transformative are two things. Number one, uh, blood tests that can actually detect the abnormal proteins that cause Alzheimer's disease and the structures are now available. There's, a, there's one that we offer through Mayo Clinic Labs, and we're soon to offer another. Uh, others have them as well. And also now, because we understand how these diseases develop, there are now therapies that are being um, that are being introduced and validated and approved by the FDA for use for, for the treatment of Alzheimer's. Like a lot of chronic diseases, they're much more effective when they're used early in the course, right? So that's mm -hmm. why getting tested and confirming the diagnosis early is important. And why is it a looming crisis? It's because, unfortunately, you know, it's something that most individuals will develop if they live long enough. And as our population ages, and particularly as the number of older people 
outweighs the number of younger people available to care for them, uh, our, you know, our ability to keep us alive longer is going to lead to more of these kind of more chronic debilitating conditions. So it is. It's actually one of the major concerns. If you read the literature on the future of healthcare and healthcare delivery, um, you know, neurodegenerative diseases, of, you know, with which dementia is the primary manifestation, it's one of the major concerns, actually, for global health in the, next, in the coming decades. Who should be tested? Probably, I mean, if people who are, you know, feeling like if they have some memory loss, I mean, talk to your physicians first. Um, you don't want to do it just willy-nilly, right, mm-hmm. because it, it, it leads to a lot of other tests. So it's not like, boy, I, you know, my mom, my mom kind of started losing her memory. Maybe I should go get a test. It's not like that. But if, if you're, you know, if you feel like you're having a hard time remembering things or a hard time, uh, com- you know, completing tasks that you normally could complete, particularly for my age, or, you know, in your, in your 50s or early 60s, or in that, anything older than that, you really should talk to your physician about getting tested. Uh, both Golden Retriever Guy and Dan from Rochester showing just how, I guess, compassionate our audience is. They want to know whether you're fully recovered from that biking accident, and more specifically, how's the tooth? <laughs> I was wondering about that because actually it's been about it's been about two years since that happened. I'm pretty much fully recovered. Um, I am fully recovered. Everything is is uh, you know I'm doing well. I'm back on my bike. Um, I finally had permanent teeth in I think about eight months ago. So it was a long road with a lot of surgeries. Um, I think they look pretty good. I don't know. Uh, they feel a little. I can't floss in between them. My front three teeth I can't floss in between anymore, which feels a little weird. Yeah, but. Uh, you know, it could have been a lot worse than that. That, that is, that's for sure. Uh, we we know that that story was. Yeah, you were you were fair to say you were actually fortunate, right? As much of rehabbing oh. as you had to do, and the tooth thing, the process that was, you were a very fortunate man. Six one two guy. What does the knocker think about the latest grilling of Dr. Fauci by the congressional panel? <laughs> well, it's been it's been interesting theater, I think for sure. You know, I'm struck by, I mean, there's a lot of things. It, it, it brings me back, honestly, to some of the conversations you and I had early in the pandemic about things were going to be recommended. Um, a lot of it was empiric, you know, which is a word that Fauci used, but that were going to be cause for debate in, in the aftermath, right? Because they were so disruptive to how we did life yep. and lived life and lived life. And we don't didn't really know how effective they would be. It brings back a lot of that. Um, it also seems a bit ironic to me. By and large, I think most people want to move past COVID and not even think about it. And it's a little disappointing to me in that you know, there's a lot of focus on this, whereas there, the, the ability for like Mayo Clinic labs and other labs to bring up testing for people and do a lot of the stuff that was we know was helpful in, early in COVID was because there was a congressional act called the Pandemic All Hazards Preparedness Act that gave the government the authority to do the things that it did in the face of a pandemic, they're struggling to get that bill reauthorized, even though we have things that are out there that, you know, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of false alarms, you know, maybe in flu might be one, but sooner or later it's going to happen. Hopefully not in this generation, but so it's, our, it's, our, it's disappointing their focus is on that and not on actually just doing something effective to help, help us be prepared for the future there the, the folks are coming with a lot of interesting questions uh this is 651 guy and I, th- this might be hitting you cold but i'll we'll try um he said he writes this isn't an infection question but the extensive knowledge of human anatomy and physiology should pay dividends prime drinks are exceedingly popular among kids they claim to promote hydration they include a lot of things that aren't in traditional electrolyte replacement drinks this includes vitamins and minerals some of these are at the max recommended daily doses for adults, and a ton of kids are drinking these. My son, he writes, developed vitamin toxicity from prime drinks, and I'm wondering if the knocker knows if there's any research being done about the impact of these synthesized fat-soluble vitamins on our kids. Well, first of all, I'm thinking I, my phone really did drop before, but I should have saved that for the hard <laughs> question. Yes. Um, but no, I mean, actually, it, I did actually see an article that was just uh, that was just published on this. I didn't get a chance to read it yet. Vitamin toxicity is real. I think the other concern is for these drinks that have very high levels of stimulants. 
you know, yeah, caffeine right. type stimulants. You can get arrhythmias from those, you know, and heart palpitations. So it is. Uh, I think it's. I would. I would imagine that this is an industry that's going to might get some closer scrutiny because we're hearing more stories like this. Because you're right, he's right. I mean, very, very high levels of certain vitamins can cause toxicity. Even really high levels of vitamin C can give kidney stones. I mean, there's lots of different things. Um, that's why there's recommended daily amounts. And so it's important that if you're using those, that you balance the use of them with just regular water, right, so that you don't get into it's, – it's really consuming. One might not be dangerous, but if you're consuming a lot and you're sweating a lot here in the summer – that's where you can get into trouble. So you want to balance those with just some good old-fashioned water. I knew you could handle it. Uh, Dana in Fargo writes, My father-in-law was an anesthetist and was diagnosed with an aggressive form of ALS. Why haven't we been able to solve ALS? So ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, is a, it's, a, it's a tragic disease, right? And, of course, Luke Gehrig was diagnosed at Mayo Clinic. That's right. And, you know, we talked about We read the that. letters. We read a long time ago. In fact, we might even had a guest on that because I think there was a documentary laying out the amount of time he spent at Mayo. Yeah, yeah, it was really remarkable, right? Um, and it was, uh, so that's, uh, that's where the, the Luke Gehrig disease was penned, now ALS. Um, it's, it's a tragic disease. It tends to strike, you know, relatively, uh, you know, and people in, earlier in life, when they're still, you have a lot of productive years left, and it's it's pretty terrible. I've you know I've had good friends that have suffered from that um, and have passed away from that, and it's it's a pretty because it, basically your neurologic, your thinking and your feeling stays intact, but the disease attacks the muscles in your or excuse me the nerves in your spinal cord that allow you to control your muscles. So you basically weaken and waste away and to the point where you really can't breathe, and then that eventually succumb. Um, and so it's, it's been, it's very difficult. To, um, it's, it's not that common. Um, no one really knows exactly the pathophysiology, at least the last time I checked, you know, what causes it. Interestingly, um, there, I just talked to someone yesterday. Uh, there was a young couple in DC in Congress, um, where they, they met, uh, they were part of an administration, I believe, um, in HHS even perhaps. They met, they got married uh, the day that their first child was born. The father found out was diagnosed with ALS. And oftentimes the first symptoms are not things that would make you think you have this kind of life-altering and ultimately fatal disease. He did pass away um, eventually, I think, from the disease. But during the course of his life and now after, it, he, they started a foundation which has done a lot of different things to help ALS patients, I think, including... Um, giving them much greater access to clinical trials, um, much greater. I think they now, are, if you have to get, uh, you know, insurance support at the time of diagnosis, you don't before you get severely ill. So it's, it's it, they, she can take solace in the fact that people are really actively advocating on behalf of ALS patients, and there are a lot of therapies that are being looked at. This might be one where the whole area of treating diseases with cells, so-called regenerative medicine, might be able to make some real headway. Uh, last item for today. I'm looking at, uh, there's a series of headlines having to do with, I believe, a new lung cancer drug trial that is getting these rave reviews. And I always look to you to, you know, get more info because I don't, you know, you don't want to overrate something too soon. You want to temper reaction because that, that sounds really, really favorable when you're talking about any form of cancer. Um, on the other hand, if it's a breakthrough that might be big, you don't want to underplay it either. Are you familiar with this development, this story, this research? I know of it. I know also there's a similar, I think, something similar in colon cancer okay. where there's a new therapy that's being re being introduced that are showing really dramatic results in the early phase clinical trials. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm aware of it. I don't know it in depth, but um, I think there's just a couple of notes of caution. You know, first of all, it's... Uh, you know, these, the trials are designed for, as they are for a reason. There's usually two, three phases to a clinical trial. One where you just have to prove that the drug is not going to cause harm. That's called phase one. Phase two is where you have to generate some evidence that the drug actually does what it's intended to do. And phase three are the big, big trials where you have to really prove it out over time and, of course, the most expensive. So it depends on where it is, you know, in the life cycle of this. A lot of times those phase two results or even phase one results will get released can cause a lot of excitement. It remains, but it has to be seen if it bears out over time. 
But I can tell you the flip side is that since the pandemic and in the intervening few years, there has been a really a renewed focus on developing much better cancer drugs that work in really novel and unique ways that really do can't target the cancer and even can target the cancer and the immune system at the same time to get your body to fight the cancer. And I think it's some of those newer classes of drugs that are showing some of these remarkable results in early trials. So the hope is, and again, they probably won't work for everybody. I don't think there's going to be a cure for cancer, but I think we're going to see more and more better cures coming and more and more ways to validate their use more quickly. So, so it, it, it is, uh, we might really be on the threshold between the Alzheimer's treatments I discussed before and, and cancer that, that we'll see within the next decade or so some real changes in, in terms of how effectively we can help people that, with their illnesses. That's big stuff. 651 guy is hoping that the next time you're on, you can compare, contrast Mayo Clinic versus the Cleveland Clinic. Um, do you guys, I mean, trash talking is big in so many industries. Do you folks at Mayo, do you trash talk the Cleveland Clinic? Do you even consider them worthy of trash talk? I mean, is that, is that, is that, would that be your big rival or do you, does Mayo Clinic have no rival? Well, is that the one in Cleveland? <laughs> just kidding. No, no, I just get It's interesting. Um, well, yeah, I mean, look, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's a bunch of we're competitive people in medical school and everything else. We do. Yeah. I mean, certainly health systems compete they, for reputation. Uh, we, but they say, but we're collegial at the same time, right? Because we got to be focused. And you're in healthcare. Your your job is to do the best you can, be the best you can be, but also to help as many people as possible. So it's a little bit. I would put it as a mostly friendly rivalry. Damn it! Interestingly, Cleveland Clinic, I think, was actually started by a couple of physicians who trained at Mayo Clinic. Funny, and of then wanted to do something similar in Cleveland. And so there's a lot of similarities. Again, a lot of really super high quality people there. In fact, our new chair of lab medicine and pathology, Dr. Eric C, who replaced me in that role, actually. Uh, was my friend and colleague for a long time and a leader at Cleveland Clinic, and now is here. So, so it, it, there's a lot of so there's a there's there's trades too. Just like Devin Booker for one cat, I guess I was able to. You know, we always want to work together, so we got him here from Cleveland Clinic. Even this, yeah, this is a subtle form of trash talking. Yeah, uh, you know, they they the guy who you know was started Cleveland Clinic. Of course, he came from Mayo because everything starts at Mayo. So that was very well played, very subtly played. You made it sound like we're very collegial. Everybody loves one another, but you got the jab in there, nevertheless. Um, you haven't, you haven't. I don't think you've lost a step, man. I think you picked back up, wow. handled a lot of stuff in very short order, and it uh, reminds me that we probably don't want to go back to weekly, but we need to have you on more than once every four or five months. So we'll uh, we'll try to work on that. I'll catch up off air as well. And thanks again for the for the time. Oh, thanks for having me on. I always I'm happy to do it whenever I can. Appreciate you. That's Mayo Clinic Big Knocker William. We call him Bill because we got to. Well, actually, we call him Big Knocker Maurice. Joining us on the fan, um, I've got a little bit more from the D Day anniversary to get to today, which we explored earlier in the five o'clock hour. Andy Rooney landed on the beach of Normandy days after D Day, which of course is eighty years ago today. And back in two thousand four, he shared a firsthand account of, quote, a day unlike any other. We're going to play that back. We thought today would be a perfect opportunity to do exactly that. We'll get to that in a couple of... Well, this was inevitable. I think sooner or later we were going to get a little bit of um, knock or pushback. 612 guy writes, Dan, always enjoy the knocker. Funny, affable. But working in healthcare here in the Metro... Sometimes these interviews end up being a commercial for the Mayo Clinic. They don't have any secret books in Rochester. Let's not put Mayo on some pedestal. Does he have a point, or is that a little bit of old-fashioned envy and jealousy? I don't know. Is that the Angel Reese of the medical field? It's a fair question. I... To a certain degree, anytime you have a regular guest on and they work for something, it becomes, you could say, a commercial for that particular enterprise. Just listen to Johnny Athletic today. <laughs> he said the Athletics seven times. Good point. What's his record, do you think? Not as high as Russo, probably. Yeah, yeah I think Russo's ahead of him. We right. need to have a covenant catch up with, too. That's also true. 
you're exactly right. I, 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 I'm here to tell you that often I would disagree respectfully with 612 guy. I don't think it often does end up being just about Mayo. And sometimes it's because of questions I ask, but I think we certainly in the COVID days, we covered a lot of ground that went well beyond Mayo. Even the, some of these, his answers to questions today regarding various afflictions from the very outstanding um, audience out there had very little to do with Mayo. So I, I, I don't agree with the assertion. And finally, I would say this, and, and maybe I'm not objective uh, because of our relationship and my, my own experience, myself or others around others who've, who've, who've uh, been in the Mayo system. I think it is a cut above. I don't think that's anything all that controversial to say. That doesn't mean it's the only place that treats, you know, patients well and has all the answers. I'm not here to say that. Uh, but I think that place is remarkable. I, I really do. So now am I, you know, I'm not getting paid for it, but I, I'm not going to run from that belief. I'm, and I'm not alone. I don't believe, am I? I there's, there's a reason why people reason, come from all over the yes, world for I think, various things. I think there is. That's not the same thing as saying that's the only place that you could be treated with success and effectiveness and compassion and all those things, but I would throw that into the mix. I mentioned before the break, uh, we spent some time in the 5 o'clock hour uh, talking about what took place 80 years ago this day. Um Normandy, the beaches of Normandy, where we began, the United States and allies began the effort. June 6th was the first day to say, we're taking Europe back from Nazi Germany. A remarkable day. So much has been written about it and said about it over the last 80 years. Garzi found a commentary from the 60 Minutes commentator, Andy Rooney, who um, I think... 2004 is when this particular commentary took place. Rooney had had landed on the beaches of Normandy days after that first day, June 6, 1944. Let's listen to what uh, Andy Rooney had to say on that occasion. Because it was part of my life, I'd like to say something about D-Day. I don't know how to say it any differently than I did in a book I wrote called My War. If you are young and not really clear what D-Day was, let me tell you. It was a day unlike any other. There have only been a handful of days since the beginning of time on which the direction the world was taking has been changed for the better in one 24-hour period by an act of man. June 6, 1944 was one of them. What the Americans, the British, and the Canadians were trying to do was get back a whole continent that had been taken from its rightful owners by Adolf Hitler's German army. It was one of the most monumentally unselfish things one group of people ever did for another. We all have days of our lives that stand out from the blur of days that have gone by. And the day I came ashore on Utah Beach, four days after the initial invasion, is one of mine. As we approached the French coast, there were small clouds of smoke and sudden eruptions as German artillery blindly lobbed shells over the hills behind the beach. They were hoping to hit U.S. troops or some of the massive amount of equipment piled up on the shore there. Row on row of dead American soldiers were laid out on the beach just above the high tide mark where it turned into weedy clumps of grass. They were covered with olive drab blankets, just their feet sticking out at the bottom, their G.I. boots sticking out. I remember their boots, all the same on boys, all so different. No one can tell the whole story of D-Day because no one knows it. Each of the 60,000 men who waded ashore that day knew a little part of the story too well. To them, the landing looked like a catastrophe. Each knew a friend shot through the throat, shot through a knee. Each knew names of five hanging dead on the barbed wire in the water 20 yards offshore. Three who lay unattended on the stony beach as the blood drained from holes in their bodies. They saw whole tank crews drowned when the tanks rumbled off the ramps of their landing craft and dropped into 20 feet of water. There were heroes here no one will ever know because they're dead. The heroism of others is known only to themselves. Across the channel, in Allied headquarters in England, the war directors, remote from the details of death, were exultant 
They saw no blood, no dead, no dying. From the statistician's point of view, the invasion was a success. Statisticians were right. They always are. That's the damn thing about it. On each visit to the beaches over the years, I've wept. It's impossible to keep back the tears as you look across the rows of markers and think of the boys under them who died that day. Even if you didn't know anyone who died, your heart knows something that your brain does not. You weep. If you think the world is selfish and rotten, go to the cemetery at Colville sur Mer, overlooking Omaha Beach. See what one group of men did for another on D Day, June 6, 1944. Andy Rooney, 60 Minutes. That commentary first played in 2004. And as he says, uh, June 6 is the date, 80 years ago today. We'll come back, wrap it up with a couple of texts on that very subject, and prepare you. For tomorrow's program. Brought to you by American Pressure, commercial grade pressure washer since 1975. It's the Bumper to Bumper Show Wrap. Yes, I think it's there. The opportunity, I should say, no, that's not the one I was looking for. I got a, uh, a, a June 6 text I want to get to, and then one more piece of sound. Love that you're covering this very important history, uh, Dan. My wife and I had a chance to tour the beaches at Normandy a few years ago. If you ever get a chance to do it, it's highly recommended. You actually get a chance to walk inside of the German bunkers, and you can still see the divots where the uh, Allied bombs landed. Everybody, I've never, I've never visited. Uh, well, I've never visited France. I've been to the airport. Well, actually, that's not true. I covered a Winter Olympics there, but I've never been in Normandy. And everybody who does say it is remarkable it is dramatic it is obviously um emotional as well i uh, want to thank all of our guests today justin jefferson he joined us in the th- late in the three o'clock hour uh johnny athletic with the latest uh, timberwolves uh, ownership breaking news um the big knocker bill maurice joined us as well in the five o'clock hour um and some really good contributions of as we brought back by popular demand for the first time in about a month, Dr. Dan's inbox as well. Uh, so all of that will be available via the podcast later. We found Gargi found another piece of sound apropos for this date, the 80 year anniversary of D day, June 6, 1944. And it's a, an interview between uh, Christian Amanpour from CNN fame is interviewing on site one of the veterans of that campaign brought back on the beaches of Normandy for the, I guess celebration is the wrong term, but it is an attempt to pay proper homage to those few now still alive, capable of traveling, let's say from the United States, to be a part of said event commemorating June 6, 1944. His name is Jake Larson, 101 years old. Let's listen to what he had to say earlier today. Do you remember what it was like when when they just, I don't know, suddenly you find yourself getting out of one of those landing craft, you're on that beach. Do you remember what it was like? Oh, do I? I like, like it was yesterday. I, I, I got on a landing craft, and I had water right up to my chin. He, he let us out a little bit too far, but, but he was just a 17-year-old p- pilot for that boat. Wow. You were all kids? We were all kids, yes. And did you know then what you were fighting for? Oh, yeah, oh definitely. That we knew, every one of us. Tell us. Were, Every one of us was prepared to give our life to kick Hitler's ass out of Europe. And like you I, did. And we did. We lost quite a few of us. I lost friends. Everybody lost friends. But we, came, we, we were soldiers. We were prepared to give our life. Jake Larson, born in Owatonna, Minnesota. That's the kicker. Enlisted in the National Guard in 1938, lying about his age since he was only 15 years old at the time. You know, one of the great, most memorable guests that we had on a continuing basis for many years 
was a soldier named Colonel David Hackworth. He, too, lied about his age to serve because it was that important to him. Um, It's just, to me, heartwarming that he could get back there, that Jake Larson could get back there again and clearly could still speak to it, be appreciated, and be told, once again, the important role that he played, Owatonna, Minnesota's finest. We appreciate all the contributions today, textures and from our guests. Should have another good program tomorrow. It'll be the Friday show to wrap things up. Thanks, as always, for listening. Thanks for texting. Fan on Demand on the Air follows us on this, what should be an extremely special day in not just American history, but world history as well. We'll talk to you tomorrow at 3.